Creighton, we draw upon that tradition to enterprise that we're about. And we all know, we're very much aware that the way that healthcare has become in our country in this time can mitigate against our humanity. So we have to work harder than ever to care for, tend to our humanity so that we can be the kind of healthcare professionals that we want to be. We want to be compassionate as well as competent, of course, and more than competent. We want to have exceptional listening skills and all of those things. We want to um, really take seriously the humanity of our patients. But with so many things that overwhelm us, how can there be room in our humanity to do that consistently, deeply, and well? Um, that's what we're about today. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge that um, I've, I've, I'm using parts of the Ignatian tradition, we'll talk just a little tiny bit about St. Ignatius, as a context for the kind of reflection that, is, uh, that has its roots in this tradition. Um, there are lots of kinds of reflection, as we know, and this is a particular kind. Uh, but I also am drawing upon uh, a book called Heroic Leadership by a fellow named Chris Lowney. Chris happens to be chairman of the board of Common Spirit Health, but that's really not uh, kind of the way that I know him. He was a Jesuit for about eight years, and we, we entered Jesuit training together um, uh, in different provinces, but at the same time, and we got to know each other um, while studying communications in New Orleans. And, and Chris, um, he, he, he looked like um, a plain clothes, subway cop. And so when we would take the subway in New York City from the Bronx to Midtown Manhattan at night, Chris would just lean against one of the, the poles and glare at everybody. And it, it kind of kept everything calm in the subway car and we felt entirely safe. Uh, so I've, I'm always grateful to Chris for keeping me safe on the subways of New York. But he uh, eventually became an investment banker and figured out that the Ignatian tradition doesn't just help religious communities or the Jesuits, that the lessons of the Ignatian tradition can help any human enterprise. Because St. Ignatius, first of all, is deeply engaged in the world, in the real world. He was a soldier. So we're going to just... Uh, talk about him for a moment. Um, so the learning objectives, um, to understand the characteristics and purpose of Ignatian reflection. And in order to do that, we're gonna locate it within Ignatian leadership and strategizing and so on that are very much part of Creighton. To discuss Ignatian reflection as a resource for strategizing and for leading. And then to uh, discuss Ignatian reflection as a help to human integration, compassion, and meaning finding. Now, those things are particularly uh, important to healthcare professionals today. Um, meaning finding is one of the, the great challenges. People come to, to healthcare, to medicine, with enormous ideals. They want to help people. You want to help people. And so much of the way healthcare is structured works against it um, in that deeply human to human interconnection. So much works against it. Uh, and so I contend, and I work with the national uh, team at Common Spirit about uh, provider engagement and so on. And it makes me crazy when there's any hint that, that what we really need to do is to teach people to be more resilient. And I say nonsense. That's to say, teach people to put up more readily, more placidly with things that are inhuman. <laughs> That's nonsense. It's, it's, instead, it's important for us to reinvigorate our humanity and to find ways to support that humanity uh, for one another, with one another, 
in healthcare in a very challenging situation. So that's my uh, sort of uh, bias, and it's not an unconscious bias. It's a, an above board right out there in the open bias. Okay, so here's St. Ignatius. He's busy writing the constitutions of the Jesuit order. All right, so a little bit about why the Ignatian tradition is particularly relevant to healthcare. So it's not an accident that Creighton has all of the health sciences schools um, as part of one campus with the undergraduates. It's not an accident that Creighton is the, the largest educator of Catholic healthcare, uh, I'm sorry, the largest Catholic educator of healthcare professionals in the United States. Lots of the students are not Catholic and that's actually a blessing for us. And so as we begin this, um, that's one of the uh, things that are uh, fundamental assumptions. While St. Ignatius is rooted in the Catholic tradition, um, uh, his spirituality, his approach to life is widely appealing to people of all faiths and, and with a humanistic background of any kind. So one of the reasons that he's uh, particularly applicable to healthcare is there's a universality and a deeply rooted humanness to his um, spirituality, to his relationship with God. Okay, so a couple of things that um, uh, in, in, in Ignatius's life history make him particularly what relevant to the, those of you and those of us who uh, work in healthcare at all. So Ignatius had this, this vision uh, first of all, he started out as a soldier and uh, a minor courtier in the kind of a remote um, part of the, the uh, reign of Isabel and, um, oh my gosh, King Ferdinand um, in Spain. And uh, he, he was felled by a cannonball um, at about the age of 30. And he really started his life over. It got his attention. And he said, what am I doing with my life? Is this, is this what my life is about? And he began a, a religious conversion. And instead of wanting to win sort of all the geographic territory for the, the royalty that he served, he, he decided that the thing to do was to try to win over the whole world um, for God. And uh, so figuring out how to do that, getting educated to be able to do that, growing in his spirituality and so on, a long story. Um, and, uh, but along the way, Ignatius had a vision, um, and this would have been in the early 1500s, that serving God didn't have to be in churches or monasteries or hermitages exclusively. Of course, a person could serve God there. But in those days, there was kind of a, a natural aversion to what we call the secular world, you know? And Ignatius had a, a revelation from God, kind of opening his eyes to look at the world and God saying to him, this is your monastery, Ignatius. This is the place to find me and to serve me in the world as it is, um, and to bring my presence into the world. And that may seem kind of self-evident and obvious to us today, but in his day, it was a radical notion um, because there was a, a, a sense of great divide between being religious or you know, going to church and the rest of life. That that was the place of temptation and this is the place of salvation and they didn't mix very well. So for St. Ignatius to look at the world and to say, absolutely every human endeavor is the place to find God and to serve God. So we talk about that as finding God in all things. That's a big deal for us because for us at Creighton, we see your expertise in science, your rootedness in basic science as a wonderful way to discover God, to understand God. Why? Because Science delves into the mysteries of the way things are, the mysteries of creation. And, and 
Um, for us, you don't have to have this perspective, but our perspective is that opens our eyes to the one who created. To discover um, God's design and God's plan in science is uh, a, an excellent way to know more about God, just as theology might be. So that's a big deal for St. Ignatius. But the other thing that's really important for him, he was deeply engaged in the world, a soldier. And so strategizing and caring for his troops and help, uh, having to understand the soldiers that he commanded, knowing them better than they knew themselves, um, being aware not only of kind of external characteristics, but what was going on deep inside of them. What uh, were they, um, uh, you know, filled with courage? Were they timid? Um, were they depleted? Were they worried, worn down, beaten up? Um, what was going on inside of them? Um, who, who should be best paired with um, this group uh, in order to, to succeed uh, best? So that kind of insight we call cura personalis. And you've heard that expression before. But to know those with whom you work and your patients um, and to be aware of what's going on inside of them, not just what they say literally, but what they're saying um, sometimes without words. So another thing that helps us very much in, in the healthcare enterprise. Um, but for Ignatius too, there's a, a, an even more practical and imminent part of his, his journey of becoming a, uh, a leader of a religious order and founder of schools and so on. Along the way, in order to support himself as he studied and, and prepared uh, the spiritual exercises and so on, he often lived in hospitals and volunteered in hospitals in order to um, serve God, of course, but also for room and board. And he came to see that as so important, a model for any kind of service, that for young Jesuits in training, he picked only four or five things that they must experience if they're going to be Jesuits. And one of them is a hospital probation, a hospital experiment, as he would say. And so in my time, in training, we were sent out to go get, uh, to apply for jobs as orderlies in nursing homes. Um, we don't have orderlies anymore, I suppose, nursing assistants today. And um, to, um, to do that work, because Ignatius's insight was this, if you can't take care of people physically in the most humble of their needs, you can't do anything else for them either. If you can't love people when you're cleaning you know, cleaning them up after a mess in bed, if you can't do that and still love them, you're not going to be a Jesuit or a priest or a Jesuit brother. So it's built into the, the training of, of young Jesuits that we start. We all share some sort of basic healthcare experience that uh, kind of grounds us um, in this spirituality. Okay, so Ignatius the soldier, um, as he gathered um, the other young men who became uh, the founders of the Jesuit order with him, working with them in the founding of schools and then uh, governing the growing body of the Jesuit order in the world. These are all um, important parts of Ignatius's life from which we draw uh, the uh, understanding of Ignatian leadership and reflection. So those are kind of the sources. So there are pillars of Ignatian leadership and that's, it's not, um, it, it's, it's really characteristics of being in the world. Ignatius just assumes that we're all leaders. So it's not a leadership course. This is how to be in the world to, to bring about um, greater influence on people, the right kinds of influence. What kind of human being, what kind of human characteristics do I want to um, uh, cultivate in myself? So for St. Ignatius, 
And remember, he's, he's a man of the early, the, the, the early to mid 1500s. Self-awareness is a huge characteristic for our leadership in the world. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, the ACGME sent out um, an expensive invitation to a webinar, uh, a course sponsored by the ACGME. I kind of looked at it, and then when I saw how much it cost, I said, yeah. I don't think so. Um, but it's called using self-awareness as a leader in healthcare. A couple thousand dollars. Well, here, I've just saved you a couple thousand dollars each. Um, self-awareness is crucial. So this is really an important thing. The leader understands and is comfortable with his or her strengths, weaknesses, values, Obstacles and blind spots, biases as well, knows themselves, their worldview, their personality style and, and all, and is at peace with those things. And also then at peace with humanity in general. Now, for me, this is the way that I see you as healthcare professionals. I see you as students of humanity practitioners of humanity who are exceptionally talented in medicine. But I see you as people who have the almost exclusive privilege of any of the professions in the world of coming face to face every day deeply with what it means to be human, with what it means to be human. And every one of our patients can teach us something about what it means to be human. Am I asking myself that question or reflecting upon that um, after the course of a day? What did I learn about being human from my patients and myself today? That's a reservoir, a resource for us that allows us to locate every patient we will ever encounter in our understanding and our affectionate embrace of what it means to be human, even the painful parts, especially the painful parts, self-awareness, the expansiveness of vision of the leader, which is to say, um, to be open-minded, broadly minded, to recognize that the human um, condition, creation itself is enormously complex and diverse, and that there are lots of ways of doing things, lots of ways of seeing and interacting with the world. So being expansive in our vision. So the leader is confidently innovative and able to adapt constantly to a changing world and changing goals. Now, does that have anything to do? I mean, this is St. Ignatius. Why does he say this? He was a military leader. Every day, several times every day, the battle changed. They have different resources, fewer resources. They're in different geography. The weather is different. The soldiers are injured. All of that, every single moment of every day, it's changed. Now what? To, to, just, to, just to take that as the given and say, my response is not to be victimized by change, not to be rebellious, resentful of change, not, not simply to, to, to be a doormat to change either and let change walk all over me, but to say, this is how life is. And my response has to be constant understanding and adaptability and, and to bring the vision to bear in the change circumstances and to re-strategize. So constant adaptation and constant strategizing. Those are um, qualities of the Ignatian leader. Now we are gonna get to the reflection piece, but actually once we do, you'll see that all this other stuff was really the reflection piece. And so, you know, okay. So this one is particularly important to affective engagement. We are by nature intellectually engaged and cognitively engaged. You and I 
are better at analyzing, assessing, evaluating. But what does that leave out? It leaves out mostly our affective selves. Reflection is, for most of us, um, an intellectual exercise. For St. Ignatius, it's not. It is deeply affective as well as cognitive. And, and for, uh, for that reason, it really is distinctive and distinctively helpful for healthcare professionals because your mind may be tired at the end of the day, but your interiority has been challenged and exhausted at the end of a day. Where does compassion come from if you don't have any room to feel anything for a patient? Where does compassion come from if you are feeling yourself so wounded that you just can't stir any compassion. And that's the reality of our lives. But the answer isn't to let go of that desire. The answer is to be renewed and to have a regular practice that renews us so that we have, we're alive to our interior and can make choices that help us to nurture our interior lives. So um, we'll come back to that theme. Um, another pillar, um, greatness of heart, a heroic stance toward life. So an expansive view, more of an intellectual reality, a greatness of heart an ability to embrace affectively, to welcome affectively what life brings and to be rooted enough that one isn't swept away by what one needs to embrace. But, and to be energized then and to energize others by stirring heroic motivation, greatness of heart, nobility of cause, desire to sacrifice for something greater than self to transform the world. Doesn't that sound like what your lives are, are for? The ideals of your profession? There's such nobility in medicine. It's hard to think of anything more noble. More filled with a desire to serve humanity as it is. Not in its easiest moments, in its most difficult moments. And when we do the more difficult things without any fanfare or calling attention to ourselves and know that we've done it together and there's a sense of quiet camaraderie and pride and satisfaction and fulfillment, is there anything better? Greatness of heart is what we're after. And finally, discernment. To be able to sort through stuff and to find the patterns, to find the things that lead us away from our path, that strengthen us on our path, to choose the best thing among uh, many good things, to be sensitive to what's going on inside of ourselves and in one another, discerning in that sense, uh, awareness of those things, to be rooted and to have kind of our feet planted firmly so that we can see clearly and not just be tossed about by the things that happen, but instead have a firm standing place to say, okay, this is what is going on now. Um, how can I bring the best of us to this and move it one step toward greater wholeness and so on to be rooted um, and discerning? Okay, so uh, I'm, in the slides, I've, I've um, given a, a greater, a deeper uh, analysis of those things. And I've done it for two reasons so that, you know, if you, 
if anything in here seems worthwhile, um, you can have the slides, of course. But in the first part of these in-depth analyses, um, uh, here's the first part is about what St. Ignatius would say, how St. Ignatius would see it. And of course, that's from a religious perspective, um, not necessarily a Catholic perspective, just a religious perspective. Uh, but uh, then Chris Lowney. Yeah. Chris Lowney so, is, is trying to take those, those lessons from Ignatius that were uh, offered in a religious context to say there's simple, fundamental human wisdom there that's applicable in the corporate world. Um, and so his heroic leadership book is to be given to corporate leaders to say, if you want to run a better organization, here are some principles and here are some practices to help you do it. So you, in each of these little sections, you um, have the Ignatian stuff. And then as Lowney says, here we take, take, it, take the human wisdom out of it. So leaders thrive by understanding who they are and what they value by becoming aware of unhealthy blind spots or weaknesses that can derail them and by cultivating the habit of conscious self-reflection and learning, cultivating the habit of conscious self-reflection. Okay, so in each of these areas, we're gonna have um, the religious significance and the just plain human significance of each of those things. So that's kind of to go back to. Um, okay. So with all of that, our context, if any of that is appealing, do I want to be a person, um, a healthcare professional who has greater self-awareness so that I am more rooted in my, my particular uh, land of humanity here and able to uh, be a, a visitor, an ambassador, to every other expression of humanity that I will ever see, to be responsive, to be understanding, to, to have uh, a compassionate grasp um, that most people are doing the best they can. And uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work very well sometimes, but there's that fundamental thing. Okay, if, if that appeals to me, if I want to have an expansiveness of vision, if I want to be effectively engaged and engaging with others, um, remembering that the most important moments of my life have rarely been simply intellectual or cognitive. They have had emotional content and maybe that has been the most important thing. The birth of uh, our first child, each of our children, um, falling in love, wedding days, deep friendships, and someone reaching out to us in our grief. These fundamental human moments, of course they have uh, intellectual content, but it's the feeling. We all know that what someone says to you may or may not stick with you. But the way they treat you, you will likely remember forever. It, in, in my little world, people generally can't remember after a few years the priest who presided at their wedding. Who cares? They, you know, I mean, you might have a strong relationship with them, um, but it's, it's about the couple and their guests and so on. And, and really, that's actually the way the church sees uh, us doing weddings. We're just a witness. We don't perform the wedding. The couple perform the wedding for each other. They, they offer the sacrament to each other. The priest is just the witness. And if you're going to the reception, they, they put you with Aunt uh, Jessica, um, who just came back from Fatima. Um, and, you know, and you think, oh, 
The chicken dinner is not worth it. Okay. Preparing couples for, for marriage, the most wonderful thing. The ceremony itself, wonderful. But the goal is not for them to remember you. Funerals, everybody will remember who did a loved one's funeral and what they said and how they said it and whether it was personal or not. Isn't that applicable in some way to your life? Do, do we want to remember the person who gave us our flu shot? I, I, I remember her right now, but you know, next month, ask me, who cares? But someone who helped me through cancer or after heart surgery, remember forever. Okay, if that matters to you, okay. Uh, so all the, the others, discernment, to be able to sift things and, and not just to uh, be overwhelmed by them, and the greatness of heart, the ability to embrace humanity and, and also change. Um, so if any of those things seem valuable to you, um, and I kind of think they do, uh, you demonstrate that every day. Ignatius gives us this tool to help us grow in those characteristics, to cultivate those characteristics in ourselves. And he calls it the examen. And it's short for examination of consciousness. Consciousness, awareness, not conscience. Consciousness, the examination of consciousness. There are a lot of forms of it. He gives us kind of a fuller form, but I'm, I'm saying, okay, busy healthcare professionals, if we take the first couple of steps, that'll, that'll be enough and we can always build on it later but the examination of consciousness in its briefest form, its reflection that's both external and internal. So important, this part. What was going on in me today? Why is it that when this particular patient, I see their name um, or their chart outside the, uh, the clinic door, I think, oh, oh no, Lord, give me strength. And that patient is me. I, I, I don't know if any of you remember um, uh, Dr. Bot, uh, Dr. Butra, uh, Agandra Butra. Um, he was my allergist. I love that man. Um, and, but he, uh, you know, he, he loved to shout at me. Um, and of course it delighted me, but I would, when, when, when I would go to see him, the residents and the medical students would come in and I'd say, listen, I'm terrified of this guy. He's going to come in shouting at me, and I can't take it anymore. You've got to save me. You've got to help me. Um, uh, preserve me from Dr. Bo uh, Butra, rather. And, and so, of course, he'd come in, and he'd be shouting before the door was open. And, and there, I'm looking at the residents and the medical students because I've set them up, and, uh, and they, they're, they're, they're trying to do something, but there's nothing they can do. And I know that. So I'm just kind of watching them kind of in turmoil because uh, they think I'm suffering here. And then of course I'd tell them the truth. I love this guy and he shouts at me because we're friends. Um, but anyhow, you know, what, what, what happens to us interiorly stays hidden most of the time. We don't talk about it with each other, but you know, if we're both, if we're all doing the exam and the examination of consciousness, it opens the possibility of saying, you know, I noticed I've been working with my resistance to particular patient, so on. Reflection is cognitive, spiritual, and affective. It's all of those things for St. Ignatius because any one of them alone is useless. Cura personalis, it's engaging others as whole human beings from the wholeness of my humanity. And so it, it has to engage all of these. Uh, our, our consciousness is largely unexamined. The things that we dwell on through the course of the day, if we would stop and, and uh, just chart 
what we're dwelling on at any given moment, um, well, I know I would be embarrassed um, at how petty uh, some of the things I'm dwelling on really are. Um, and how unworthy in a sense, how, how they do not at all engage the larger project of being the best caregiver possible, of really deeply caring for people. So more and more, as I examine those things, I can aim them more deeply, more uh, consistently toward the project, the mission of real care for real people, whole people. Our consciousness is largely incomplete. We see the things that are broken, disappointing, irritating. We see them so clearly that it's overwhelming. And because those things loom so large and because we're trained to think critically and to analyze, assess, evaluate, um, you know, what about the rest? So this project of the examen helps us to be more in touch with the fullness of reality to the extent that we don't use this tool, I'd say we're likely to be out of touch with a good part of reality. So, and our limited awareness holds us back our awareness can be retrained. Okay, so now we come to this very simple exercise. And here's the deal. If I had just started here, you'd say, oh, geez, you know, he seems nice, but that's just vapid. Um, that's ridiculous. But all of this stuff can be touched by a really simple process. The examine. He asked, Ignatius asks us to stop once, ideally twice a day, and to ask two questions and to reflect, to live with those questions as fully and completely as we can, to think about them, to feel them, to connect them with our spirits. Two questions. The first one, oops. Sorry. Um, the first one, what has happened so far today for which I am grateful? For which I am grateful. So this gets to um, what Dr. Vivekanandan was saying has been helpful for her <clears throat> as a daily practice. If, if we, I, here's, here's my promise, and I'll give you, um, all the money that I have, if this isn't true, I got nothing. But nonetheless, I'm willing to, to sacrifice it all. If this isn't true, come back to me and I'll, I don't know, I'll give you something. This practice, if one would stick with it at least once a day between now and next September 27th, we will have a noticeable difference in who we are and how we live, how we are for others. It's, one of, it's the simplest thing that Ignatius gives us and it's the most transformative. It's what we most desperately need. So here's the catch. It's hard for us at first. In fact, we're lousy at it. What has happened so far today for which I am right now, this moment, grateful? Well, when we first start asking ourselves that question, we don't have very good answers. We'll say, well, I'm alive. Of course, that's, <laughs> I don't mean to underplay that. That's a pretty darn good thing. But we reach for these big things that are you know, just sort of general things. And that's not, a, that's, we have to be grateful for that, but that's not what Ignatius is about. He's saying, in the stuff, the real stuff of this day, the concrete reality of my life, the seeing of too many patients this morning and, and fitting them all into that much time, in the, in the circumstances of that, what am I now grateful for? And I suspect that for most of us, we'd say, great gratitude. I mean, I'm just overwhelmed. I'm, you know, can I tell you again how much I hate the EHR? Um, and, you know, 
uh, it seems like everybody is running behind today. And, uh, you know, okay, there's plenty of stuff that clouds that. That's why we have to ask the question to recover our sight, our consciousness, to cut, recover the rest of reality. And if we consistently ask the question, here's what happens. We're sort of competitive people. And, you know, our consciousness will say, okay, this person here that I'm dealing with, me, is going to ask this question again tomorrow. Well, I'm not going to be um, struggling for an answer tomorrow. You know, you've, had, you've all had the experience in training. Um, an attending asks you a question and you don't have an answer. What do you do? You go home and study that until you could give a dissertation on it the next day, right? We're just wired that way. So if we keep asking the question, our consciousness will be retrained and it will notice good things that are buried in each day, filling each day really, and hold on to them better. Okay, but Ignatius asks us <clears throat> to ask a second question that helps us even more. What has happened so far today for which I could have been grateful and should have been grateful, but I either missed it or I let it go much too quickly. Let it get crowded out by something else. That question asks us to go back, kind of as the watch suggests, through the hours of the day and remember what happened. Not just remember intellectually, remember the feelings, remember the meanings, the satisfactions or the aversions, to remember what happened and to see where I could have been grateful or should have been grateful, but I missed it or let go of it too quickly. Now, here's the thing about that. Being grateful is a multi-leveled thing. If the question were, what happened so far today that was perfect? You don't need even one sheet of paper to record that. It's what could I have been grateful for? Should I have been grateful for? And I missed it or I let go of it too quickly. And that pushes us, retrains us to be much more nuanced. So um, uh, Father Embach knows this. Um, we have our, a, a superior in our, in our community here in Omaha, but we also have a big boss in um, Chicago and a bigger boss in Rome. Okay, so the guy from Rome leaves us alone. But the big boss in Chicago comes and grills us once a year for an hour, each of us. And, you know, when we know he's coming, we all clean our rooms and we, you know, all this stuff. But anyway, no, he's really a great guy. He's, he's actually to help us keep growing and stuff. But he, he came to me and he said, okay, you know, these are all good things. But here's something that I notice about you that I think you need to work on. Okay. I don't want to hear it. Um, uh, but the thing is, in this question, if, the, if the, um, the question were what was perfect, well, my imperfection, something that I, that a fault of mine, something I need to work on, it would not make the list. But here's the, here's the more nuanced thing. Somebody cares enough about me to bring this to my attention, to challenge me, to be more to be a better human being. And so that day when I did my exam and I said, you know, I am very fortunate. I am very blessed. I am thankful that Carl is interested enough in me, that he knows me well enough, that he cares about who I am and wants to help me grow, that he challenged me. You know, it's, it's, it may be, before I left home, and I've been especially tired lately, um, uh, 
I, I, you know, my spouse, someone in my household, we had to have kind of a difficult conversation about like a little area of conflict. That doesn't make the list of the perfect, but it does make the list of being grateful for if we look back and say, and so I thought about it in advance. I chose my words carefully. I made sure that my facial expression was loving and I used a good tone of voice and I listened. How did I do all that? Wow, that doesn't sound like me, but the conversation went pretty darn well. So having a difficult conversation that goes pretty darn well, that's a blessing, that's a gift, that's a moment of goodness that fills my life every day. So see how it, it teaches us to dig in and find the goodness even in the challenges. So I might say, I know I had more patience this morning than I wanted to have. But I, I was able to be present pretty darn well and to have a personal word, even just a personal phrase for each of them. And I looked them in the eye. And I think they all felt good about the visit. That's worth being grateful for. And it, it reclaims. Now, you know, that doesn't mean we, we don't want to keep working at the way medicine is structured, right? And, and to, to lay the groundwork so that we have more of that. But it's, it's also a way of hedging against saying, I'm a victim of, of what medicine has become and it's such a burden, it crushes me every day. Well, that feels true at, at times, right? But instead to say, okay, I, I, I assess the way it is, and I'm going to look for one thing I can say to each patient to redeem so much of that stuff. And then I'm going to be grateful when it makes a difference. That changes me. It changes me for tomorrow. So if we will do those two questions at least once a day, at noontime or at nighttime, or both, between now and next September 27th, we will be more optimistic, more hopeful, more empowered, more compassionate, more energized, more life-giving for patients, for family, for coworkers. We will say, I am grateful to be a physician, to be a PA, to be a resident, to be a medical student, to be a nursing student, whatever our healthcare profession is. I am grateful to be that. And I know that I have the opportunity to experience the humanity of others in a way that nobody else really has the privilege of doing and being. I am grateful. And I will even say to my students and residents, if I'm an attending, I love being a physician. There's a lot about the structure of healthcare that is difficult today, but I love being a physician. And saying that, Knowing that there's a lot of difficulty, challenge, it changes us as well. There's a, uh, a medical school out east, in fact, <clears throat> that um, for those who are faculty uh, at that medical school, they say, every day you are required to say to your learners, I love being a physician, or I love being a PA, or whatever it is. And if you won't say that, you can't teach. Well, imagine how that was welcomed by the faculty. Well, I'm not sure that I'd even do this again if I went back to, you know, all of those things. There's so much. And they, you know, naturally, they say, I, I don't want it. That just seems like a charade. Well, then go with the charade. Um, fake it until you make it. And the grumpiest physicians who hated the idea the most, they came back to kind of interview them and they said, you know what? 
saying that to my learners every day changed me. It made me notice the things that I do love about being a physician and to put in perspective the things that I hate. Because there are things that are really difficult about being a physician today or any kind of healthcare professional. But I do love it. It changed them. So, um, am I going the wrong way? Oh, okay, here we go. This is just the last little piece. And it's kind of fun because it, it gives you a sense. This is the religious Ignatius, of course. And we, we know that he's a, a man of faith. He's trying to serve God. Um, but we can all um, translate this into our own faith tradition or our, just our humanistic point of view. Ignatius hates ingratitude. And it gives us, a, of course, it's an English translation of his Basque Spanish. It seems to me in light of the divine goodness, so with God's wisdom, though others may think differently, that ingratitude is one of the things most worthy of detestation before our creator and Lord. In God's eyes, God detests this, in other words. And before all creatures capable of his divine and everlasting glory, out of all the evils and sins which can be imagined. Okay, that's a pretty big claim. For it is a failure to recognize the good things, the graces, and the gifts received. As such, it is the cause, beginning, and origin of all evils and sins. Pretty big claim. On the contrary, recognition and gratitude for the good things and gifts received is greatly loved and esteemed both in heaven and on earth. Well, I, I, I believe what he says about in heaven, but I can attest, yeah, that's gratitude is pretty highly esteemed among us. So that exercise of the examination of consciousness once or twice a day for this coming year, it will cultivate all of those other characteristics in us over the course of the year. And if it doesn't, come back to me and I'll give you a picture of St. Ignatius for your dartboard. <laughs> Some information about continuing education credit. Thank you very much for listening to all of that.